So I think we're ready to start. And I hope everyone's in. There's more people coming in as we speak. So thank you very much, first of all, everyone, for coming to our seminar, our webinar on the UNCRC, What Does It Mean for Families? Um, we've got a couple of really great speakers for you, and I'm going to introduce them a bit later on, but I'll do a, a few things first. A little bit of housekeeping. I think everybody's probably really used to this by now, but it would help us if you kept yourself on mute and put your video off just to keep bandwidth going at the minute. Um, when we get to the discussion later on, we'll probably ask you to put your videos back on and be able to see each other. It's a great shame always that we can't actually meet in person. So if people want to introduce themselves in the chat and say where you're from, who you are, that would be very nice. Um, and just give us and other people an idea of who's here. Um, first of all, just to introduce Parenting Across Scotland. We're a partnership of organisations who work with families and so on. It's, sorry, I've already done something where I've moved the, the screen on. I wanted to say that the, the partners are Abalawa, Children in Scotland, Contact, Families Outside, One Parent Family Scotland, Relationship Scotland, Scottish Adoption, Scottish Families Affected by Alcohol and Drugs, and Scottish Commission for Learning Disability. And so I suppose the question in a sense is why are we putting this seminar on and why are we interested in the UNCRC? And we're really interested in the UNCRC because it really talks a kind of language and the kind of ideas and values that we've been talking about probably even before we knew very much about the UNC, UNCRC for a long time, in that the child is very much part of the family. And in order to consider a child's well-being, the family really has to be part of that equation. The UNC obviously doesn't see the child as a unit in isolation, but part of society, and in particular, part of the family. It sees the family as the natural unit for the child to grow up in, and that the state should support families in that task. It says, recognising, I can't see my slides actually, um, with this, I don't usually read out slides, but this is just part of the UNCRC preamble. And it says, recognizing that the child for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. And I think that's actually really quite a wonderful, you know, thing about how the child should be seen, how the family should be seen. But we know is saying that the family is a fundamental group in society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members. We know that, this, that it, it's saying they should be afforded the necessary protection and assistance, but this isn't always the case. We know that some of the very necessary infrastructure, the complete basics around income, around poverty, around housing, those necessary foundations that every family needs to bring up their children are not something that, you know, is given within the state, either whether we call that the UK or whether we look at Scotland. And, you know, so much of Bree, she's going to speak later, her work has been about child welfare inequalities and how very often um, children who grow up in poverty are more likely to be taken into care. And we were part of the care review and part of the Edges of Care group, which looked very much about how can we afford families that necessary protection, what needs to be done to keep families together. And so that not just on the edges of care, but way before that, that families ought to be given that help very early on. And we're very heartened to see that within the, um, within the new programme for government, there is the 500 million Whole Family Wellbeing Fund. We hope that's going to be designed and shaped with families, with both parents and children feeding into what kind of support they need. 
Um, and I suppose the other reason in particular that we're concerned with the UNCRC and you know, why, why it's important for families is that when you look at the range of our members, they represent different sort of family shapes and sizes. And, you know, the kind of the members that we have, some of their, the, the people they work with, the families they work with, are most likely to have their rights infringed. So, for example, contact with families affected by disability or families outside who are families affected by imprisonment, you know, the contact with family, with family members and with parents, um, Scottish Commission on Learning Disability, learning disabled parents are so much more likely to have their children taken into care. So it feels really important for us to afford those people their rights and to make sure that families stay together, that they actually get the support that they need to do so. Some of that is about, we've talked about parental awareness, but we set up a group recently to look at parents and the UNCRC. And we were reminded very strongly that it's not just about awareness, it's about enablement and it's about empowerment. And it's about making sure that parents who for the most part want to do the best for their child are given that information, given that given the knowledge about the UNCRC so that they can use that and be human rights defenders for their children. Oh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I've told you why I'm doing it, but what I want to do, we've got two speakers, Juliet Harris, who I imagine many of you will know. Juliet is a veritable powerhouse and a driving force for the UN. <laughs> Sorry, Juliet, but you are. <laughs> driving force for the UNCRC in Scotland and will tell us about what's been happening with UNCRC in Scotland and why it's important. And then we'll have Breed, who will talk about it from a more values perspective, the you know, model of um, child protection as a social con as a social model. And um, I think you know, they're going to be two different, very different speakers, but it will lend itself to great discussion afterwards. And if you want to put questions and so on in the chat, we will be, we will have time afterwards for questions and discussion. So I'll hand over to Juliet. Thank you, Claire, and thanks so much for inviting me here today. Um, I think I have to object to being a powerhouse. I think the powerhouse is um, together as members and the organisations and people that we work with that have made UNCRC incorporation possible. Um, and I know it's, it's kind of that powerhouse of all of us here, the community, the child rights community in Scotland, um, that will really make sure that UNCRC incorporation delivers on our expectations. Um, and it does make rights real for every child, every young person and supports families across Scotland. So yeah, thank you, thank you Claire. Um, so yeah, in, in my presentation today, then I just want to kind of go through the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in Scotland and explore what's in the convention, what incorporation actually means. Um, because um, I know certainly when I first heard about incorporation, I was very intimidated by the idea. I'm not a lawyer. I thought, gosh, this is something way beyond, way beyond my grasp. So I want to be able to kind of go through what incorporation means and show that actually it's something that everybody can use as a tool to advocate for children and young people and support families. You don't need to be a lawyer to do that. And so I want to kind of go through that and then explore kind of some of the challenges, I think, um, that we'll have in making sure that it does deliver a revolution on children's rights um, like, like we all hope it will. Um, but just to start off on my next slide, I've just included a little bit of information about Together um, because we're not the most well-known of charities, I don't think. Um, so Together is uh, an alliance of over 480 members um, and we're working to improve the awareness, the understanding and the implementation of children and young people's rights in Scotland. And our 480 members um, include kind of large organisations, international organisations like Save the Children and UNICEF, national organisations like Bernardo's, NSPCC, but it also includes parenting groups, after school clubs, uh, academics, 
anybody with an interest um, who shares our vision that all children and young people growing up in Scotland have their human rights respected, protected and fulfilled. Um, so we support our members through kind of training events, resources, and we have a, um, a e newsletter that we publish every two weeks. And if you don't, if you don't um, kind of receive that e newsletter, then I would say do go to our website. Um, just a little plug, sorry, Claire, but do go to our website, sign up, um, because it really does um, bring you the latest news on what's happening around children and young people's rights. We also use this as a way of amplifying and um, amplifying the work of our members so if you're doing some work on children and young people's rights your work with families let us know and we will publicize it across the sector um, i have to say we've got nearly 2,000 people who subscribe to that e-newsletter so it's, it's quite powerful um, so that is just one part of everything that we do to work to inspire and enable everybody in Scotland to put children and young people's human rights at the heart of everything that they do. And this includes our mission covers government, but it covers families, it covers children and young people and um, everybody working in Scotland trying to make sure that children and young people's human rights are absolutely at the centre of everything that they do. So that's about together, but moving on to my next slide, then I want to reflect on what we were doing exactly six months to the day um, ago, um, back on the 16th of March, um, 2021. Um, exactly six months ago, we celebrated Scotland taking one step closer to what the Deputy First Minister described as a revolution in children's rights. So it was on the 16th of March 2021 that the Scottish Parliament unanimously supported the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law. The Minister for Children and Young People at the time said that the UNCRC incorporation bill would mean that children and young people's rights would be woven into the fabric of our law, our policy and our public life in Scotland. She went on to say that children will have the right to be involved and heard in relation to the decisions that affect their lives, and that this will mean we'll all have to act to change things. And when budget is required to support services that enable the fulfillment of children's rights, it will need to be provided. And I think that's a really important thing to reflect on. When budget is required to support services that enable the fulfillment of children's rights, it will need to be provided. This was said by a government minister. And I think we would all agree that family support, family services, they enable the fulfillment of children and young people's rights. And so UNCRC incorporation is so important because it recognises that actually um, to support children and young people's rights, you need to invest in children and young people's rights. And that investment includes family support. This revolution in children's rights has support from every party across the Scottish Parliament. Um, so it was welcomed by the Greens, the Scottish Conservatives, Liberal Democrats and Scottish Labour. Um, I particularly like um, Mary Fee's penultimate speech to the Scottish Parliament that she made as the bill was going through. She said, in leaving this Parliament, the best parting gift that I can give is empowerment, protection and respect for all our children and young people through the passage of this monumental bill tonight. Empowerment, protection and respect. That is the power of UNCRC incorporation. And the bill was widely welcomed by children and young people and by their families. Um, parenting across Scotland welcomed the bill, um, saying that we believe it offers the opportunity to affect transformational change for all Scotland's children and their families. So it's transformational change that we're talking about with UNCRC incorporation. Um, a child giving evidence to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee said that the bill helped emphasise that children and young people have as much of a right to say as anyone else in the country. And another young person described incorporation as a way of children and young people having their voices heard, knowing that they're listened to and knowing that they matter. So it was such a significant moment for Scotland's children, for our young people, for our families. Um, social media was buzzing and buildings across Edinburgh and Glasgow were even lit up in UN blue for days. Um, members of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child actually joined children, young people and their families, as you can see from 
partying. Um, and they joined us to dance, to play, um, so with parents, with youth workers, with teachers, social workers, and we're all celebrating this potential of this revolution in children and young people's rights. We all celebrated because we have this vision of a Scotland where the rights of all children and young people are made real all of the time. And on my next slide, um, I've got a picture from the Children's Parliament, which I absolutely love. It shows the UNCRC as a house in which everything else belongs. Um, so it shows how the UNCRC covers every aspect of children and young people's lives. And when we're, when we're listening to kind of different government initiatives and different priorities, whether it's whether we're looking at kind of trauma informed practice, whether we're looking at ACEs, whether we're looking at GERFEC, whether we're looking at curriculum for excellence, and um, whether we're looking at housing, the environment, transport, all of this is included in the UNCRC. So the UNCRC, it's not an add-on, it's not another initiative, it's a lens through which everything else needs to be seen and everything else needs to be done. Um, so on my next slide, again, I kind of revisit what Claire said in her introduction, because I think it's so important to reflect that when we're talking about children and young people's rights, um, we really recognise the fact that, as the UNCRC says in its preamble, which is UN chat for introduction, um, then it says that the child for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding. Um, and I think that is absolutely key, that the UNCRC is all about supporting families, supporting parents, supporting carers to make sure that children and young people's rights can be fulfilled. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child really recognises the central role played by parents and played by families in ensuring that children and young people can grow up healthy, happy and safe. Um, so it just provides that a really strong framework for those working with and for parents and with and for children and young people to advocate and provide assistance to families in um, legislation, policy and practice. Um, and in this slide, I've particularly kind of brought out the fact that there are four general principles of the UNCRC. And I think it's worth everybody having these general principles in their mind in everything that they do. And these are four of the 42 articles that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has said are of particular importance. And I think they really echo with all of the work that's been um, done with parenting across Scotland and with families across Scotland, thinking of these general principles in everything that we do. So the first is around non-discrimination. So this means that we need to constantly question, not are we getting it right for most families, but we need to question, are we getting it right for all families? Who are the families whose rights are most at risk? And what, what are the rights that are most at risk in these, um, in these families? What can, we, what can we do to make sure that no child, no young person see, experiences a breach of their rights? And so I, I, think, I think it's absolutely key to kind of reflect as well on um, the kind of phrase about um, no one being left behind. That is a rights-based approach. It's about making sure that no child, no young person, no family is left behind and everything is done to secure the rights of those families whose rights are most at, re at risk. And the next general principle is around the best interests of the child. So this is Article 3. And I think this is kind of, again, quite a well-known um, one of the UNCRC articles, making sure that every decision um, considers the best interest of the, ch of the child um, and has the best interest of the child as the primary consideration. Something that's so important with this is every decision. And that is key when it comes to um, families because it's not just decisions around children's services. It's not just decisions around education. It's decisions about family support. It's considerations about social security. It's considerations about transport, um, about the environment. Every decision, not just those that are directly about children, every decision must consider the best interest of the child and have the best interest of the child 
as a primary consideration. The next general principle is around survival and development, Article 6 of the UNCRC. And something that I like to think about with Article 6 is what do we need to do, not just to make sure that children and young people survive and develop, that, that's the minimum. It needs to be what can we do to make sure that children and young people thrive? Um, so what can we do to make sure children, young people and their families are able to realise their fullest potential and be the people that they want to be? The final general principle, which I think is one that everybody knows about, is Article 12, children and young people's participation. And this is absolutely key in making sure that children and young people are given the opportunity to um, put their views forward on decisions that affect them and to have those views um, taken into account. Um, it's really important to say that this does not mean that doing everything that children and young people say or everything that they do. It means just treating them with respect, treating them with dignity, listening to what they have to say, listening to what's, um, what their preferences are, what, 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 what they would like to see, and taking that view into account. It does mean providing feedback. So if we're unable to take their views forward, we provide feedback as to why and how and what we're going to try to do differently. And so within the UNCRC, there's also um, a, kind of a thing called the three Ps, although academics argue about this and sometimes they argue there's four. In fact, the latest article I read was that there's seven. But anyway, for now, I shall concentrate on the three Ps around provision and um, protection and participation. Um, and this is absolutely key. So within the 42 rights of the UNCRC, you can divide them into these three Ps. Um, provision is about the obligation on governments to make sure that children and their families have everything that they need. So this is about food, nutrition, housing and education. It's providing those services to children and their families to make, help make sure that they thrive. The next P is protection. So protecting children and young people from all forms of harm and exploitation and violence. And then the third P is participation. And when we're looking at participation, we're not just talking about Article 12 for children and young people's views, but we're also looking at freedom of expression and freedom of association so that children and young people can be active agents in their own lives and their, their own societies. I'll just give you a quick preview of the fourth P that people, people consider is actually about promotion, because if children, young people and their families don't know that these rights exist, how can they ever claim them? So I think the fourth P that I've not included here about promotion, making sure that people know and understand children and young people's rights is also absolutely key. And moving on to the next slide where I've included the 42 substantive articles, but you probably can't see them that well, I'm afraid, because they're rather small. We will make sure that we circulate these slides um, after, after um, today. Um, but it's important, even though I've picked out the four general principles of the UNCRC, it's really important to look at them as, as a whole, um, because there are absolutely key points. Um, children's rights are universal. Um, so rights are for all children, regardless of race, religion, abilities, or really importantly, family circumstances. So children and young people's rights are absolutely universal for all families, for all parents, for all carers. They need to have support from government to make sure that children's rights are fulfilled. Um, children's rights are unconditional. And so they don't have to be earned. And they're not dependent on responsibilities. Children have these rights regardless. And that principle applies to parents and families as well. Parents and families are there to help, they help to support children and young people's rights. And these rights are absolutely unconditional. They're about what are needed for children to thrive. Um, children, so human rights are inalienable, so they can't be given or taken away. Um, the government can't suddenly decide one day, oh, you've not done this, you've not done that, so I'll take away your right to education, I'll take away your right to be listened to. Absolutely not. Um, and they're inherent, so they can't be taken away. Um, and finally, human rights, children's rights are indivisible. So it's important to always think about the fact that rights are completely interdependent and they depend on each other. Um, for their effectiveness. 
So for example, children and young people, they have the right to relax, to play, but they also have the right to freedom of assembly. Um, and they need to exercise both of these rights for either one of them to work properly. Um, again, the right to food and the right to education. If a child isn't having the right to food properly fulfilled, if a child is hungry, that's going to impact on their right to education. They're not going to be able to concentrate as, they, as they're at, at school. And the set right to housing, then if you've got wet, damp, terrible housing, how can a child really thrive at school and reach their full potential? So it's absolutely key that we recognise the fact that human rights are indivisible and all depend on each other. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, the bits are coming up. Um, yeah, moving on to the, the next slide um, around families and the UNCRC. Then I've said, I've said already that across these 42 articles, um, parents and carers are referenced throughout they're actually directly referenced um, in Article 5, Article 18 and Article um, 27. Um, and that's because the UNCRC, it defines the context in which parenting takes place. It really supports parenting that's respectful of children and young people's rights and considerate of the needs of parents. Um, the UNCRC is really clear that children need care, they need security and they need an upbringing in a family that's respectful of their rights and their individual individuality. Um, so across the UNCRC, it outlines the role of the parent in guaranteeing and promoting the rights of the child and making sure that their best interests are always taken into account. Um, it also sets out kind of how parents um, can fulfill their responsibilities for children and young people um, and help to make sure um, that the family really does provide the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all of its members. Um, so I mentioned kind of Article 5 um, in terms of the UNCRC requires government to respect the responsibilities, rights and duties of parents um, to um, um, in a manner that's, uh, sorry, tongue twister, in a manner that's consistent with the evolving capacities of the child. So this is recognising that younger children need more support from their parents, they need more provision from parents, and that as a child grows up, then children will start to make more decisions on their own. Um, but they really, these, these articles 5, 18 and 27 really support the primary role of parents um, and carers in raising children and you'll see in detail then references to parents and their families are made throughout um, no less than 23 of the 42 articles so I've even I've been to a lecture um, by somebody who argued actually we need a UN convention on the rights of the child um, because he was arguing um, that actually the UNCRC is so much about families and parents that he wanted another one distinctly about about pet um, about children themselves um, but it's just, it's so important to note that the UNCRC really recognises this role of families, supports families, um, and um, yeah, it's clear that that is the best place, the family environment is the best place in, um, for a child to grow up. So on my next slide, I've kind of unpicked a bit, a few of the particularly re relevant rights. Um, Article 5, as I've said, which is about government's responsibility to respect the rights and responsibility of parents. Um, Article 18, which is about governments making sure they recognise parental responsibilities and importantly, provide resources and support to help them fulfil these responsibilities. Um, and Article 27, which I think is particularly key at the moment, that governments should help parents and carers to ensure that children are provided with an adequate standard of living. This is so key at the moment when we're looking at um, child poverty, when we're looking at the support that, that um, families need to pull them out of poverty, Article 27 is absolutely key to that. So incorporation is going to help to make these rights real. Um, but on my next slide, I start to kind of unpick what actually is incorporation. Um, at the moment, then, the UNCRC is just something that government in the UK, government in Scotland needs to think about. It's not about something that they actually have to do. Um, and 
just as an aside to let you know, the UNCRC incorporation bill, whilst it was passed six months ago today, it has been subject to a court challenge by the UK government um, on constitutional grounds. So it's that argument about what's within powers of the Scottish Parliament and what's in powers of the UK Parliament. And so that means it can't yet commence until we've had a decision on that. Um, but we are expecting, given the cross-party support for incorporation, we know there will be some form of incorporation. I'm sure the bill will commence very soon. So I'm talking about incorporation as if it's definitely, definitely going ahead. But we don't actually know exactly when that will um, that will kind of kick start. But what is incorporation? So at the moment, you at the UNCRC is just something that governments need to think about. What incorporation does is actually bring international law into domestic law so that um, children and young people's rights are then something that governments need to do rather than just think about. Importantly, it's not just the Scottish government, it's all levels of government. So local authorities, um, NHS, health trusts, um, the police, everybody needs to take into account children and young people's rights and everybody needs to comply with the UNCRC. And I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. The next slide kind of shows children and young people's um, view on incorporation. This is a few years ago. We were talking to children and young people about their rights. Um, and they said that in, they saw incorporation as being a way that you bring rights into reach. So the children we spoke to at this time, they said, we know we've got the right to live free from poverty. We know that we have the right to live free from discrimination. We know we've got a voice, but at the moment, whilst we know that we have those rights, they're like clouds in the sky. They're not tangible. They're not something that we can claim. And so they saw incorporation as a way of making rights real, bringing rights into reach, meaning that they could actually say something, they could complain if their rights weren't made real. And then on the next slide, um, it's going on to what children and young people told us about incorporation way back in 2013. And so these children are actually now adults, they're able to vote. Um, but they had a really clear understanding of the power of incorporation. They said, what's the point in having rights if they don't have to abide by them? And I think that's absolutely key for families, for parents. What's the point in there being rights for children and young people if you can't do anything, if they're not respected? And um, children told us, if it's not the law, then people might not give me my rights. And I think that's exactly the same. If it's not the law, what can families do to really advocate on behalf of their children and young people? Children told us that rights should be part of the culture of life. And that is absolutely key. If, if there's support for the family, if there's support for the family environment, so that the children are able, so that children are able to grow up and thrive, that's when rights are part of the culture of life. When there's respect for families, for the family environment and for the rights of the child. So you can see, um, I'm kind of going back to 2013, and that's because it's been a really long journey to get to this point on incorporation. And on the next slide, I kind of set out some of this journey um, just since 2014. So it's been a longer journey than that. But the Children and Young People Act was passed by the Scottish Parliament in 2014. And that was when the UNCRC was first kind of referenced in Scots law. And it meant it was something that, um, that government had to think about. And I do have to say, if you kind of cast your mind back over the past, gosh, seven years, then I think the 2014 Act has made a difference. There is so much more knowledge and understanding about children and young people's rights since the 2014 Act was passed. Um, and so it's been kind of baby steps to get to this point. But that, that's kind of the first legislative step, I think, of seeing children and young people's rights actually reflected in, in law and it has made a difference. Um, on the next slide, I'm kind of following children and young people's journey because I think it's really important that we recognise the role that children and young people have made in bringing about incorporation. Um, and so kind of looking way back to 1989, that was even, gosh, when when I was a child, that was when the UN General Assembly first adopted the UNCRC. 
Um, it was ratified by the UK in 1991, so 30 years ago. So it's been a really slow journey to get to this point where children's rights are actually made real in law in Scotland. But children and young people were shouting for this in 2013 and 14 with the 2014 Act. Um, the Scottish Youth Parliament have led a really powerful campaign with 76% of 70,000 children and young people that they asked supporting UNCRC incorporation. We've had children having cabinet meetings with, um, yeah, with the full cabinet, with the first minister, with the deputy first minister, talking about the importance of their rights. And all of this has led to this journey where finally we have the UNCRC incorporation bill. Um, on my next slide, it's a bit of a silly one, so apologies. Um, I think it's always worth looking at this bill in terms of a carrot and stick approach. Because whilst the power of incorporation is that children and young people can complain, that their families can complain if their rights aren't respected, that they can go to the courts in the most serious of cases to seek remedy and redress, then actually we don't want to see children and young people's rights being breached. We don't want to see the support for families not being there. We want to get things right from the first place. So the UNCRC incorporation bill has actually got kind of two elements to it. And the first I like to think of as the carrot, which is really everything that we've got in the bill to try and make sure that things are right in the first place. And this provides a real opportunity actually for, um, for parent, parenting organisations and for parents, because within the Children's Rights Bill, Scottish Government need to create a report every year on what they're doing and what they have done to fulfil children and young people's rights. This is called the Children's Scheme. And in drawing up this children's scheme, they have to speak to broader civil society to get their feedback on what's going well and what's not going so well. And I think it's absolutely key that the views, the experiences of parents and parenting organisation is used every single year to really push government to make proactive steps to further children's rights, but also to hold them to account when they're not. There is, of course, the stick side of it. So when things aren't done right, whether it's legislation that doesn't comply with the UNCRC, or whether it's practice that breaches children and young people's rights, then the bill does give the right um, for children, young people and their families to take cases to court. So it's just, it's quite useful kind of thinking of that carrot and stick approach. So parents, parenting organisations, families can really help to support and drive this proactive culture. But the bill does provide tools to enable them to challenge breaches as well. Um, moving on to the next slide I've included, but I won't go, I won't go to a link at the bottom of the slide to the bill. But a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, under the proactive approach, the UNCRC incorporation bill protects the rights of all children under the age of 18. All children under the age of 18. And that's important because there's quite often a discrepancy for 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland um, in the different protections that they have in law. But the UNCRC incorporation bill is for every child under the age of 18. And so I think that's, that's absolutely key. And I think, again, as I've said, a, around the proactive approach, it allows for scrutiny by children, young people. And when it says civil society, it's quite a, it's quite a vague term in the bill, but that includes parenting organisations and families without a, a doubt. Um, an important part around the provisions in the bill that allowed to challenge breaches um, is that children and young people can complain if they think their rights aren't being protected, but actually cases can be brought by organisations as well um, who have sufficient interest. So if, for example, there's an ongoing issue that parenting organisations have really identified in terms of a breach of children and young people's rights, then actually parenting organisations with sufficient interest could actually challenge these breaches in the courts. Um, importantly, the Children and Young People's Commissioner is also able to take cases on behalf of children and young people. Um, and so this is this is absolutely, absolutely key in making sure that as well as a proactive approach to children's rights, we do have these mechanisms in place to challenge when we don't get things right. 
So that's the bill. Um, but moving on to my very last slide, then I think we need to really consider today. Um, obviously, this, you know, this bill is huge. It's there. We've got commitment from government. There's a revolution in children and young people's rights. The UNCRC is so clear that to deliver children and young people's rights, to make sure children and young people's rights are respected, protected and fulfilled, we need to support families, we need to support parents and carers. And so we need to think about how we can use this bill as a tool for children and their families. So what I'd like to reflect on through to the rest of today's webinar is how can we best support and empower families to use the UNCRC to support the rights of children. Not every family is going to know about UNCRC incorporation. Not every family is going to know about the UNCRC. So what can we do to really raise an awareness of this new tool that we can use to advocate for families? I know there's ongoing concerns about the siloed approach taken across not just children's services, but across all areas of government. I've kind of reflected on the fact that the UNCRC is about everything. It's universal from transport to environment, to children's services, to education. So what can we do as parenting organisations to really ensure that the UNCRC is embedded right across all universal services? Um, and finally, what else is needed to make sure that really this bill meets expectations, that it delivers this revolution in children and young people's rights. What role can parenting organisations, what role can we play to support families to make sure that this revolution in children's rights is something that's felt by children and young people, but felt by the families around them who provide that family environment in which they thrive and develop and in which all of their rights are realised. Um, so they're my questions back to you, and I know we'll have plenty of opportunity in the discussion later on to, um, to unpick those. And I'm keen to take learning from today's discussion um, to really feed into some of our work that we're doing with government to ensure that this bill does deliver this revolution on children and young people's rights. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. And um, I've just unmuted myself, but I might warn you. Sorry, I'm saying I have just unmuted myself and thank you, Juliet, but actually you may hear a drill in the flat above me. So apologies if that's happening. It's part of the weird life that we're living these days. Thanks. I mean, that was a really great run through of, you know, the rights and the bill or, or the act as it is now and where, where I suppose it's still a bill until the challenge has actually, until it's got royal assent. But it gives us a, a very good overview and a real look at how families are in, involved in the bill and how it can be used and so on. We're going to have Breeze, who's going to give us a different kind of approach, really I mean, Bruce, we've, we've had talked to Bruce quite a lot over the years, she's presented. And one of the reasons I absolutely love Bruce's work is it very much accepts that view of children within families and that families are that natural place. And so I think she'll be giving us quite a different look. She's a professor of social work at the University of Huddersfield, and I know she'll be very interesting because she always is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. And, uh, and thank you, Juliet, uh, for that amazing presentation. Uh, I'm really desperate to get the slides because it was such a, an amazingly comprehensive presentation. I, um, I work in the north of England and I love coming to Scotland, even if it's only virtually, because uh, the kind of discussions that are happening in Scotland, uh, the kind of ways that people are thinking about children and families is so dear to my own heart. And also because there seems to be so much more hope, I think, in Scotland than there is sometimes in my work in England. Um, and I, I hope it won't seem like I'm throwing a bucket of cold water over this hope in my presentation today. Uh, but what I'm going to be trying to do and this will be in my first slide. Um, 
if that's okay, Alison, if we can start with my first slide. Okay, so the next slide, sorry. Um, both um, Claire Simpson and I love um, a writer called um, Rebecca Solnit. She's a climate change activist and she also has done an awful lot of work actually, which is very relevant at the minute, about how uh, societies uh, recover from or en and engage with uh, disasters, earthquakes, pandemics, etc. And she's written an awful lot on hope. And she talks about the fact that um, hope is something essential. It's something that's absolutely central to the human heart and spirit and identity. And we would all give up really, wouldn't we, if there wasn't hope. But she asks us to marry hope with critical reflection. And she uses to say, uh, and she uh, uses the work of a woman called Maria Popova to talk about the fact that critical thinking without hope is cynicism. And I have a lot of academic colleagues who sometimes I think, oh, come on, uh, let's bring some hope in here. Critical thinking is all very well, but we need the inspiration to get up and do things. But, uh, but she also says um, that hope without critical thinking is naivety. And I, I think that's a bit harsh, but I, I want to bring a little bit of critical thinking into the experiences from around the world of the UNCRC and also to ground the realities of incorporation of the UNCRC in the current context post pandemic, the kind of challenges that children, young people and families are facing across the world, but particularly obviously uh, uh, in across the UK. So if we look at my next slide. First of all, generally human rights instruments generally like uh, UN convention, uh, but also all sorts of universal conventions are challenged, particularly by people from what's called the global south from uh, countries that are different at different levels in terms of uh, poverty, whatever. Uh, they're challenged as a manifestation of a particular model. The, the UNCRC is seen by some people as a Eurocentric model of childhood, i.e. a white European uh, model of a particular kind of protected notion of childhood. And um, that, there, that we do need, uh, it is argued by countries, uh, activists in India, including young people actually, uh, activists in other parts of the world, that it is important to ground rights contextually, to look at what they mean in particular contexts. And often the argument is about child labour, for example. Is it automatically oppressive? Should it automatically be banned? Uh, what does it mean for children and young people to feel they are contributing to their family uh, through their labour? And does that automatically assume oppression or does it register or link into a fundamental understanding of children as part of relationships and as embedded in families and with the corresponding rights, but also responsibilities? And I'll come back to that a bit. It's also important to note uh, that countries around the world uh, and most countries now have ratified at least the UNCRC, that actually lots of places have done it for not necessarily the best of reasons. Sometimes it's about um, being able to access aid, it's performing a certain kind of identity saying, because of course, how could we be against this? How could you possibly be against ratifying or and indeed incorporating the UNCRC? But of course, countries some governments may be doing it because they want to present themselves as certain kinds of governments. And what uh, Juliet has shown us is the importance of holding those governments to the fire and using the instruments to make sure that it actually translates into reality. In my next slide, if that's OK. Um, and this is an important issue, and that's why I'm so heartened by how Claire has set up the seminar, but also how Juliet has spoken, because it's absolutely clear that it is an abomination and a distortion of the UNCRC to talk about children's rights and perspectives as if they are separate from the environment in which they're living and from particularly the supports that are available to their families. And um, this is a an issue that's particularly dear to my own heart. I use the reference here from Emily Kettle, who's actually from New Zealand, but we've both been working in different countries on the same issues, which is um, looking at how child protection in both countries has ended up uh, in, and I mean the four nations across the UK as well, because our work was in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, uh, and her work has been in New Zealand. How we have found in our research that actually um, children 
that there is that there isn't equality at all between children that there are massive inequalities in say for example children's uh, ability to live safely within their families that uh, for example uh, a child in uh, the most deprived bit of england is over 10 times more likely to come into care than a child in the least deprived and when we did our research and things are changing in scotland it was 18 times in scotland uh, that links between children's rights to live safely within their family and deprivation have to be acknowledged. They absolutely have to be central to the picture. So just talking about children's rights in the abstract without considering the context in which children are living and their families are living is uh, problematic. So if we look at the next slide. Um, I really have struggled with this for years and, and sometimes I've really worried about the way in which discussion of children's rights has seemed to separate children from their families and to separate them from their environments. And I've talked a lot to people who are very immersed in children's rights and, and this a uh, particular slide is very indebted to uh, discussions I've had with Carolyn Willow, who is from Article 39, which is the most amazing charity in England, which is doing the most amazingly important work to uh, challenge the way the Westminster government is trying to restrict rights, particularly at the minute for children uh, in um, post 16 in, um, in care. And she always says to me, and it's absolutely correct, that we need to think about that we can't assume that the family is automatically a benign place. Uh, and so it can seem a right thing to say, oh, well, we need to see children in the context of their families. And I profoundly believe that. But equally, families are full of power relations. They're full of uh, kind of relationships of both love, but also of control, of constraint. And as a feminist, I know that I and others have fought for years for women to have more independence in families and to have independence outside families and for a modernizing of the family and a changing of the way the family or is uh, organized so that uh, it wasn't just about what men dictated, it, you know, that the word of the father was not law. So women have fought for years for rights within families and outside families and are, are arguably there is there are great parallels with the struggle around children's rights this is about uh, power it's about respect but it's also about the right to a voice and um, i think one of the things that i've ended up thinking about is the notion of rights in itself can be very, very narrow and individualistic. It can assume an, an, an autonomous individual exercising their rights. It's my right to smoke. It's my right to wear a seatbelt in a way that's incredibly or my right not to wear a seatbelt or my right not to get vaccinated or whatever. And those um, expressions of rights can be actually not anchored in an understanding of our responsibility towards each other, our responsibilities towards our communities and our responsibilities towards the planet. It's my right to just burn whatever I want. And, uh, you know, I can do that without thinking about my responsibilities in relation to what's happening to our wonderful, fragile planet. And so there's been a long march in terms of the journey away from an individualistic conception of rights to what often is called relational autonomy, so that we don't lose children and women's rights within families to say, no, this isn't OK, to, that we don't lose the right to uh, uh, call upon the law to challenge oppression and violence within families. But that we also recognise that simply for any of us within a family to say, well, it's my right to change this room I'm going to sit in this room on my own every night and watch television and I don't care that I'm stopping the rest of you doing it none of us do those kinds of things we exercise our rights within our responsibilities and within our commitments and feminists have come up with a lovely phrase uh, called the ethic of care which is about uh, care for ourselves. Uh, what do we need to care for ourselves what do we need though and how is it inextricably linked to caring for others and increasingly people talk about Fiona Williams has written a great book recently on care for the planet as well as, as part of that care. So what I'm trying to say here is that rights discourses are incredibly important, but they can be very limited and they can be very selfish and they can be very individualistic. And what's lovely about the way this seminar has been framed is locating children's rights within a broader ethic of care, ethic of care for the parents who look after them, ethic of care for the environment in which they are growing up. So if we move on to the next slide, thank you. 
and now I want to ground what's happening and how uh, th this wonderful situation that you are in in Scotland can be located within the current context and the challenges that we are facing as a country and as a world, really. So um, it's no um, illumination to you, it's no new message to say to you that COVID has both exposed as well as intensified the inequalities in our current landscape. Uh, the history of pandemics, the history of earthquakes, the history of disasters uh, is that um, uh, but particularly of pandemics, for example, the Spanish flu. Spanish flu um, brought both loss and gain. Uh, we saw uh, what was going on as well as we lost so many people. And that's what's happening now. What we're seeing is there are massive inequalities in who's died during the pandemic, where they came from. What, what kind of living situations they had, what kind of work situations they had. And there have been massive inequalities in how we've all hunkered down during lockdown and how we have faced this pandemic. So although it's been a global universal storm, we've come to it from very different places and we're coming out of it in very different places. So if we look, for example, in the next slide at who's died, it's not been a great leveler. You know, it's it's common for people to say, well, we're all in this together. We're not all in this in the same way together. Mortality from COVID-19 has followed what's called the social gradient, which many of you will be familiar with. It's a term from public health. And basically it argues that uh, every increase in deprivation brings a, de brings a decrease in good things for people. Uh, it's more likely that you'll die early. It's much more likely that you'll have mental health issues, uh, drug addiction, uh, all sorts of issues follow the social gradient and sadly they're all the bad things so um the causes of the causes of the virus who died was not just a simple matter of being exposed to the virus it was about the whole range of circumstances in which people became exposed to the virus so the people who were most exposed to the virus were people who lived in poor and overcrowded housing the people who were most exposed to the virus were the people who couldn't afford to isolate when they got sick so, so they went out and drove their taxis or they went out and did frontline work in various ways because we simply had not set up a social framework uh, that allowed them to be able to isolate safely so parents for example faced massive uh, ethical dilemmas do i go out to work and ensure that my children are fed or do i stay at home um, and keep safe from the virus uh, and run the risk of my children not being fed mothers and fathers raising their children in high-rise uh, housing uh, faced huge you know 17 uh, floor flats faced huge dilemmas around do I take my children out to get a bit of green space or do I expose uh, and therefore expose them to infection in the um, staircases and in the lifts if they're working. So um, if we look at the next slide we'll see the consequences of that. In terms of um, people have become much more interested now in intersectionality and intersectionality is really important in terms of understanding children and young people and uh, all our lives really and what it argues is that across um that categories that may seem abstract but are really really important like class ethnicity uh, disability age etc that they all come together in people's lives to make some people much much more vulnerable to certain circumstances than others. So in terms of dying, this was not an equal opportunity virus. Black and minority ethnic families were much more exposed because they were much more likely to be living in poverty. They were much more likely to be living in overcrowded housing. They were much less likely to be able to self-isolate because they were in front-facing jobs. Uh, many of them were self-employed uh, because, partly because of racism in the job market. So it's a safer bet to set up your own uh, situation as a taxi driver or whatever. But it does mean that you are less able to access sickness benefit when you um, need to. And this is a stark reminder, and this is back in 2020, so it may have got worse since then. This is a stark reminder of the differential consequences of the virus. If, if um, you know, some people were much more exposed to dying through this virus than other people were, and there were systematic uh, reasons for that. It wasn't a question of uh, individualized risk, risky behaviors. It wasn't a question of individualized uh, bad bad look, it was systematic and patterned. 
So if we look at the next slide, this um, tweet went a bit viral in back in April 2020. Um, and it was basically, do you know, we're not all in the same boat, it said. Uh, we're all in the same storm. Uh, we're facing a global pandemic. But some of us are on super yachts and some of us have just the one oar. And the research that's been done since then, including at my own university uh, with uh, Phil Brown's work on what it was like to lock down in the north of England in private rented accommodation. Some of the work that's been done around bed and breakfast accommodation by Shared Health in Greater Manchester highlights how difficult it was that for people like myself, I locked down in a nice house with a garden and I was able to uh, transition seamlessly to uh, working from home. For others, um, they were sharing cooking facilities, bed and breakfast aren't suitable places for families anyway. But we have had a crisis around housing that's been 30 years in the making and the chickens came home to roost during the pandemic. Albert Camus wrote about the plague that it illuminated uh, a kind of certain level of corruption in our society. And this, uh, that was in his novel, The Plague, the pandemic has illuminated massive differences in terms of who had access to digital literacy issue, um, to uh, computers, who could access learning quickly, who could access green space, who could access um, safe spaces uh, to isolate, who could stay at home and who couldn't, and when they stayed at home, what kind of homes were they living in? So um, there were massive inequalities uh, exposed throughout the and uh, throughout the pandemic as uh, the food bank situation uh, the statistics tell us that uh, there was a massive increase just immediately uh, and despite um, top ups around universal credit those things have continued and and the circumstances if universal credit is uh, if that 20 pound uplift is removed you know people are warning of really dire consequences poverty levels increased uh, and uh, we became more aware of them. So if we move on to the next slide, if that's okay. For children, uh, young people in COVID, um, well, we know they haven't been as vulnerable to illness and death, but of course, um, their lives have been massively disrupted. I see it myself in the lives and learning experiences of the young people that I teach at university, but it goes right back, as you know, only too well. Despite heroic efforts by uh, people in communities uh, and lots and lots of face to face work continuing in all sorts of ways, there have been really big disruptions to early year services. There have been massive disruptions to schools, and we know that there is a huge uh, job to be done to uh, get over the gaps that have already been exposed between uh, poorer children and richer children. There have been huge disruption to youth facilities and uh, in universities, we are more than aware of not just the disruption to educational experiences, but the massive increase in anxiety and in general mental health issues. Um, there are, uh, it is no accident that Sir Michael Mama, who's been doing all the work on public health and who I quoted earlier in terms of this is not an equal opportunity virus, his work for Greater Manchester um, has He's been doing this work with how do they come out of this pandemic fairer and safer and in a better place. And his first uh, recommendation is about investing in children, young people and early years and in kind of getting that bit right, because that will be so crucial as we go forward. So if we look in the next slide. Uh, yeah, there, there are really big issues around unemployment going forward. There are really big issues uh, around what's happening in the economy. More generally, in terms of children's poverty, um, this pandemic has been more of a she session than a recession. Previous uh, recessions, particularly the 2008, 2009, uh, resulted in men losing their jobs because they lost their jobs in, in areas like construction, and areas like that were tended to be male dominated. This recession uh, is resulting in jobs going in retail and in service industries, areas where women have been more uh, 
concentrated. And historically, we know that women's poverty is very linked to children's poverty, and that uh, partly because so many children who live in lone parent families, which tend to be lone mother families. Uh, so the situation for women uh, and for gender equality uh, is really, really uh, problematic and made more problematic by what's happened during the pandemic. And, and I suppose that illustrates the importance of us always thinking about children relationally. So when we talk about child poverty, we're often talking about gender inequality and about poverty in the jobs that women are able to get and poverty in the wages they're able to get. Equally, when we talk about child poverty, we're often talking about disability. We're often talking about access to jobs that parents with disabilities have, as well as the issues for disabled children. So what it's really, really important that we always think relationally. And sometimes I worry that the language of the child and the language of children and children's rights can be used in a way that obscures the links between children's poverty and the poverty of their mothers, for example. Okay, if we move on. So going forward, um, there is a really important phrase being used by people like Michael Marmot and uh, lots of cities are, in, are embracing this, uh, that we build back fairer. That we build back fairer, not just because it's the right thing to do, but actually if we do have another pandemic, and people are saying that that is probably more likely than not, that we are in a better place, that we have solved our, or tackled some of the inequalities in our society so that people aren't as vulnerable to, uh, to ill health. They're, they're not as vulnerable to um, dying early uh, and that they're not as vulnerable to having to risk their lives. So we've built a safer economy that has a better safety net, but that also has safer jobs and that we have tackled some of the poverty that leads to poor health and leads to the vulnerabilities that laid so many people low. And to do that, we have to attend to what Michael Mama calls, calls the causes of the causes. Uh, particularly under uh, conservative governments, but not necessarily just under conservative governments. We've had a tendency to focus on behavioural issues. So we've had a tendency to focus on uh, stopping people smoking, getting people to tackle their weight, getting people to eat more healthily, uh, getting people to uh, stop drinking so much. And we framed those things in behavioural terms. So it's about choices bad choices that people are making. So um, I've heard somebody uh, during the pandemic uh, talking about giving people who were obese Fitbits so that they could tackle their obesity. What Michael Marmot says is not that we shouldn't tackle behavioural issues, of course we should, but we need to look at the context in which people are trying to live healthy lives. What kind of access do they have to a healthy food? What kind of access do they have to cheap healthy food? What kind of access do they have to um, kind of hope to uh, thinking that there are possibilities of getting decent jobs, to thinking that there are possibilities for their children of living better, of better education, of a better life, and that we need to tackle, an we have to have an ecological approach to this, and simply focusing on behaviour and choice risks pathologising people, but crucially also risks uh, losing an understanding of the fact that we exercise choices in particular contexts. So the man or woman who went out to work during the pandemic, even though they were risking their health, were often doing that because they simply could not see that they had any other choice in relation to feeding their children. Um, and, and the other thing that's been talked a lot about, which I'm really excited about, and um, is work by people like Hilary Cottam and lots and lots of people are working in this space, which is that we really need to rethink the way we've organised our society. That we've been uh, think we've been working, we've been um, operating in a way that kind of like privileges the notion of independence. Everyone should be independent. Everyone should be in paid work. Everyone should look after themselves and their families. And that we have constantly uh, run down the role of government and ro the role of the state. And what the pandemic showed us was that really good government matters incredibly. That being able to organize together to look after each other is really important. And that going forward, we need to link the role of government with the role of communities and with the role of individuals and families so that we work together and that we don't just put all the pressure and, and uh, 
emphasis on individuals getting getting a good education, getting a good job, looking after themselves. So we see the point of taxation, that we see the point of collective provision. But also as part of that, uh, which is really key to uh, the UNCRC, is that this is not just about top down government. Many of us um, across the piece now don't want government telling us what kind of services we need. We want to be involved in them. We want, we want to be part of the process of designing them. Often if you ground services in people's lived experiences, they will be better services. They will be much better located in particular areas with particular understandings of how people live in those areas. So if we look at the next, um, the next slide, um, uh, this is, um, something that I've been working on with some other colleagues. And we have talked about uh, the notion of flourishing and come, Hilary Cotton has written an awful lot about this, uh, but it comes from like from Aristotle from thousands of years ago, which is about trying to live one's life. Uh, it's trying to develop a context uh, in which we live lives that are uh, not just about surviving, and but are about flourishing, about being the best we can be. Uh, flourishing is a collective and political concept that embraces the notion of participation in the structures of society. So I would say UNCRC is terribly important to talking about the participation of children and young people. But I would argue that if we really, really want to improve the situation of children and young people, we need to hear from their mothers and fathers as well. We need to hear from their grandparents. We need to hear from the communities in which children and young people live their lives and are so connected to and derive so much of their identity from. And those things will be intention. They won't all work together. What children and young people will want will not always be the same as what their mothers want. Uh, trying to make sense of the tensions will be part of building a vibrant public sphere. So we move on to an example that I find incredibly uh, kind of visionary. It's um. The child fair state inquiry that has been set up uh, by um, Children England, uh, which is uh, a bit like parenting across Scotland, Scotland in a way, uh, an umbrella organisation for a whole range of the charities in England that work with children. And um, in 2018 or 2019, 2018, I think, it launched this thing with 28 young people uh, where they have been researching with young people and the young people range from 13 to 21 and they've been researching with children and young people across a whole range of uh, the situation of the world and um, they've been um, they've been researching how can we develop a different kind of welfare state that meets a wide range of needs uh, this has a bold vision I've given you the link to it because it looks at education, it looks at support, it looks at the issues for children with no recourse to public funds, it looks at the issues for children just coming out of care, it looks at children with disabilities, and it has a really bold vision about what we what what children and young people feel uh, is uh, is the next step in reimagining a, a different welfare state fit for the future. Okay, so I think I'm on my last slide. So the perils ahead. In a context where there isn't much money particularly, and the realities, as Juliet has shown them, the realities of really implementing the UNCRC are very, very challenging. It requires attention to provision, to protection, and to participation. The challenge, the, the perils are is that we will focus on participation and voices in Indian itself. And we see that in England all the time. People think that the that attending to children's rights is about listening to children and young people. That's just a first step. That we ignore the need to ground rights in children's realities, because it's going to need a lot of work to get this right. It's going to need a lot of work to develop proper housing, to develop proper income streams, to make sure that people have good jobs, to develop a good quality education. This is good. We've we've really gone back as a society uh, over the last 30 years in many ways. Uh, the statistics across the UK in terms of poverty, housing, education are horrendous. Drug addiction, mental health. And we have a lot of work to do. So grounding children's rights rights and children's lived realities needs a lot of courage, it needs hope, and it needs a lot of um, money and resourcing. And in a context where people don't want to face up to that, there can be a tendency, and we see this in England all the time, to see children uh, simply in reductive, um, in a reductive way as individuals uh, that uh, 
historically, we've seen a child protection discourse that has seen it as uh, legitimate and acceptable to rescue those individual children from their dangerous or damaged parents and have has seen it as a very individualistic approach uh, and has cloaked it in the language of child protection and in the language of children's rights. Okay, so just my very final slide. Alongside uh, Rebecca Solnit, uh, there is another writer, Arundhati Roy, who is an Indian activist. And she, she's also written novels that some of you may have written. And she talks about the pandemic as a portal, as a gateway between world, one world and the new. She says we can choose to, drive, to walk through it, you know, bringing our old ideas, our hatreds, our data banks, our dead ideas, you know, and the old ideas for me are that we are all simply individuals, that we look after ourselves, uh, that we can do uh, what we like as long as it's legal, uh, but that we don't, that those old ideas are that the goal of life is to be independent, is to uh, kind of like um, work hard, clearly that's important, but I think there is something more profound, which is that we think about ourselves as part of a collectivity and we think about what we need to do to make all of our lives better and how we work together. And the climate uh, crisis is really, really challenging us with that at the minute. And um, she argues that we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. I actually think we have a lot of good luggage. I've given some examples today of writers that are extraordinarily important. I see the UNCRC as part of the of good luggage. It can become baggage if we treat it in a particular way, and I've already shown that, but it can become part of the future and part of the process. Um, the last bit I would say is um, really important. People in power never give up power without a struggle. We do need to fight for this better world for children, young people and their families. So I'm not sure at all about the time. So that is me now, though. There are some references if you're interested afterwards. Um, Juliet did say um, before we all came online, the, doing these presentations is just extraordinary. You just think you're talking into a void. You have no idea what people are thinking, whether they've just gone to sleep or whatever. Uh, I hope you haven't just gone to sleep. And thank you for listening to me. And I really look forward to the discussion now. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for a really interesting presentation. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, obviously, your presentation and Juliet's came from two very different angles, but I think that they actually really, really complemented each other and made us think about the situation we're in now and what we can do to improve things and move on. I was kind of struck, I'm familiar with that, uh, we're not all in it together, the two boats um, analogy. And another analogy that I really like that Gavin, uh, Darren McGarvey uses is, and it seems particularly appropriate for now as we sit on Zoom, is that some of us sit on Zoom and others bring them food. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a great takeaway fan, but actually I do take this point. So I think possibly what would be quite useful is I mean, there were some questions from Juliet, which we could maybe put up again. But actually, if you want to, I mean, I don't know. Should we see if, we're, I hope we're not going to break the internet, but maybe it'd be nice to see some faces. So maybe you could put, if you want, put your videos on. And then we could also um, either take questions through the chat or you could put up your hand. I'm going to have a look at the chat just now and see if we've got questions. I mean, people are saying it's fascinating and it's great, which is good. And, you know, we will be putting the presentations up. You'll be able to see them. Um, hopefully more people will be able to see them. But I think what one of the things that I felt very conscious of, you know, there's a bit where Juliet said it's six months ago today. And that was a great day and it was a real celebratory day. But what I'm really struck by this morning is it's not the end, it's beginning, it's a journey. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that Bridge was saying about the situation that we find ourselves in with both the challenges and the opportunities are really important. Something sitting on the statute book doesn't do anything for anyone. It actually has to be worked at by people like ourselves. So I don't know, perhaps, Alison, if you were able to put those questions up and if anyone who would like to ask a question or make a comment or 
talk about how we might go forward, um, that would be great. I can't see any hands up, but I'd like to, because I'm sure you all have a lot of thoughts coming out of this. Um, so there's one, oh, and there's some questions coming up in the chat now, which is good. Uh, wait a minute. Apologies from being slow with this, but we're getting there. Thought-provoking, inspiring. Sorry, I'm still getting to the question. <laughs> so one of them, and I'm probably taking them in the wrong order, but about the UNCRC, what should we be doing? What are the key things that we should be doing about non-children's services? So maybe I'll ask you both to come come up with those, Bridge and Juliet. Yeah, this is a eternal challenge um, because I think it's it's always difficult across government to really break down these silos, um, and there are even silos within silos. So within Scottish government, for example, there's the children's rights team, but then children's rights aren't always um, necessarily reflected across education, and that's still within children and families. And then you've got the issue that where do children's rights fit within justice? Um, and then where does it fit within kind of broader things like environment and transport? And I think all that, all that we can do is just keep shouting about it. Um, and I think we, we have to do that with, with each other. Um, we have to always be thinking that children's rights matter across the board that families matter across the board. When government's making decisions about drug and alcohol services, about prisons, um, about the environment, all of this matters to children and their families. And we, all we can do is keep shouting and keep holding government to account. Um, and I know that that's not, it's not a very tangible answer. I wish there was, a, there was a kind of magic button that we could press where there was this common understanding across the culture of Scotland that everything impacts on children and families. But there's not. So the way to make culture change is just be persistent, talk about it, be persuasive, and always, always hold government, hold services to account and say, what are you doing to really make sure that you're thinking about the rights of children and the support that the families need to uphold the rights of children? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to breeze after that. I'm just thinking, Juliet, from a kind of you know, policy point of view, and you know, those of us who are involved in this world are continually putting in consultation responses, speaking to government, and so on. And I'm sure that you know, with things that obviously there are things that really seem directly children's services, like national care service, health, family well-being. But from now on, and I think I do this a bit anyway. But if I'm responding to a consultation on planning. I'll be talking about the rights of families and I'll be talking about children and I'll be saying, you know, we need to talk about how mothers move around with buggies and if there's steps in the way. And, you know, there are settlements, Section 75 settlements that are about community good and they usually look at schools in the area. And to my knowledge so far, they don't look at childcare in the area and we really need to. Anyway, come to Bridge. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a huge issue. It's absolutely huge. Um, I, I wonder, um, you know, it's some, some, maybe it's more about, you know, rather than just talking about the government, although they're absolutely crucial. Some of the things that happen in cities seem to me now seem to have a bit more hope. For example, uh, Andy Burnham in Manchester, or the Na New Economics Foundation a few years ago had these kind of building fair cities or building sustainable cities. And there is a bit of a movement across the world about building child friendly cities. Or, um, and I wonder within that, whether at that level, there's more hope of saying, well, if you're building a child friendly city, 
if you want have you talked to children young people and their families about what it, what is a child friendly city and how does how do housing and the different services in greater manchester work together so it does require us to become much more um, engaged with co-production and proper consultation there, we have to move away from this idea of like um and it's not always, but often men in suits deciding where a hospital should be placed, men in suits deciding where a clinic should be, men in suits deciding how the bus service should or shouldn't work. We do have to ground things in local democracy. Um, now, that sounds very idealistic, but there are across the world and there are examples of cities across the world that are really trying to develop a more sustainable, child friendly approach to how they organise and are organised. But it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. And it's it, it is despairing that you can have a prison service that, you know, talks about what is needed for women in prison and doesn't talk about the fact that, you know, what's happening to their kids or, you know, um, do we need to have mothers in prison at all or whatever? Sorry, I keep trying to put myself on mute because there is a lot of hammering coming from upstairs. Um, so there are questions coming, they can pass, and I'm going to, and I know Tina, you've got your hand up, I'm going to go through the questions in the chat first. But I think um, one, I'll direct directly at Juliet, because I suspect that where well, you've got so that as much information as there is, which is not enough information, but that one is really about someone was asking for a bit of an update on the challenge to um, the constitutional challenge to the bill from the Supreme Court. Um, there are questions about um, parents. Well, maybe if we do that one and then come to the next ones, I think that'd be forward. Okay, so yeah, the Supreme Court challenge. Um, so the UK government um, has challenged the bill on legislative competence grounds. So basically, the UK government is saying it goes beyond what is within the power of the Scottish Parliament to legislate on. Um, they've been clear that it's not about the intent of the bill, it's not about protections for children and young people's rights, it's a constitutional matter. Um, so that case was heard by the UK, UK Supreme Court at the end of June, um, but the UK Supreme Court goes on holiday um, for July and August, and I think even some of September. Um, so we haven't had a judgment on that yet. Um, we, would, we don't know when it's going to be, but I would expect it would be fairly soon. Um, and what it's um, likely to mean, it may mean that the bill needs to go back to the Scottish Parliament to have a few tweaks made to make sure it's brought completely confidently within the power of the Scottish Parliament um, before it can then um, get royal assent and commence. Um, until, until we see that judgment, we don't know if it will need tweaks or how many tweaks it will need. Um, but I am confident, given that there was cross-party support, given that every party voted for this bill, I'm confident that the intent of that bill will be reflected in the final legislation. And when it commences, there will be incorporation of the UNCRC into law in Scotland. So we just have to keep biting our nails, waiting for that judgment. And I promise once it does come out, um, we play a role together. We, we try to um, kind of do child-friendly, non-lawyer-friendly non -lawyer versions of these judgments. So we will communicate um, with Claire at Parenting Across Scotland. Um, we'll make sure that we let you know what the implications of the judgment mean and whether it's going to result in more of a delay before this bill absolutely commences. I think the final thing to say that's really important is that Scottish Government is pressing ahead with all the steps needed for implementation. Um, because we are still bound by the UNCRC and international law, we should still be doing it anyway. And the thing that the bill does is just kind of concrete everything into Scots law. So we need to continue pressing with, um, with implementation and using the UNCRC to really push for children and young people's rights and um, support for families. You're on mute, Claire. Oh, oh mommy. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted. <laughs> oh dear, when will we ever learn? Hopefully it'll be the end of the pandemic by, we, by that time when we'll be able to talk to each other in person. I'm going to take two questions together. 
um, and ask you both to answer them. And they um, questions that have particularly come up, but well, I think they're particularly pertinent at the minute because, you know, as Bridge, you've highlighted and Juliet, you too, about the, the kind of um, situations that we face as we're coming out of the pandemic. Some of these things were already there and have been both highlighted and exacerbated by the pandemic. So the first question um, is from someone who's asking about parents trying to access psychological support for their children. And as we know, there's absolutely huge, um, you know, CALMS waiting lists and how we can use um, UNCRC to change or to realise this. And then um, somebody asking, sorry, I should know the names of people asking, and I, I do find it difficult keeping up with the chat and, uh, and doing this at the same time, so apologies, but I think, anyway, to ask about how we can use Articles 26 and 27 in particular to combat child poverty and to, you know, or, or more generally, how we can use the UNCRC in the context of child poverty, which we know is rising. We know the Scottish Government has targets to meet by next year and that actually we're going to fail to meet them, um, particularly unless we double the Scottish child payment. And there were huge calls out to do so. People have asked for it in the programme for government. It didn't come in the programme for government, but hopefully it will come in the budget. Um, but how can the UNCRC be used to realise this? So I'll, take, I'll hand over to you both and I will mute myself again so you uh, escape the sound of the drill. Then if you want to go first, Brit, or, or shall no, I? No, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I I think here. <laughs> these difficult questions. <laughs> it's it's a very difficult question. I, th I think that this is one as well, and um, that relates to another question about um, children's rights budgeting that I think I've seen somewhere in in the chat. Um, and I think the, the the thing that we need to go back to is Article Four of the UNCRC, which obliges government to spend to the maximum available resources. Um, so sorry, need to spend the maximum available resources to realise the rights of children and young people. Um, and so I think we need to, we need to really um, push with government um, about which groups of children and young people are most at risk of having their rights breached or even ha are having their rights breached, because these are the children and young people, these are the families where Scottish government should really be um, investing their resources. Um, and that's that's a key part of incorporation is around making sure that nobody's left behind. Um, and so it's not about making things great for most people. It's about making sure that no child and no young person is left behind. Um, so if this means investing more money in mental health services um, rather than in new, I don't know, new buildings, I'm <laughs> making things up, new buildings or something like that then that's actually what government is obliged to do. If it means investing money in those children and young people whose rights are most at risk because of poverty, um, if it means investing in that over, um, yeah, again, new buildings, new roads, infrastructure, then actually that's what needs to be done. So it, it's, it's, a really, it's not going to happen instantly, but it's about constantly holding government to account in how they spend maximum available resources to stop to prevent breaches of the rights of those children and young people and their families who are most at risk um, and obviously it's it's very difficult it's very slow to to push for this change but that that's that's the kind of the the direction that that we we need to go in um, the other aspect of this, when we're talking about the carrot and stick effect of the of the bill, is that where children's rights actually are breached, in the most serious of cases, whether this is through lack of access to mental health services, whether this is through the impact of poverty, then ultimately we do need to get support. We need to get legal support to hold government to account for that in courts, because we have to use that stick. Um, when children and young people's rights are being breached, firstly, to get remedy and redress for the child or the young person, but also to make sure that government prioritises the changes that need to be made 
to make sure that those those children and young people's rights aren't breached. So it's, it's kind of it's a, it's a dual dual approach. We need to make sure that we hold government to account in what they're doing to spend maximum available resources to support children and young people's rights and to address the rights of those children who are most at risk. But we also need to be prepared to use the legal elements of the UNCRC incorporation bill to uphold children's rights through the courts in the most serious of cases. Yeah, I would agree completely with that. We're in a very different position in England and, and there is no chance at all of the UNCRC being in the same situation as you in the in the short term anyway. I mean, we've even had, um, we've got a, review of children's social care going on at the minute, which is uh, allegedly a root and branch look at children's social care. And there has been no mention of the UNCRC in, in, in the documents that have come out of that. So we're way behind in all sorts of ways. What we are finding though, is, um, is the importance of using the legal routes of supporting a good law project or supporting Article 39 as they take the, the government through the courts on really, you know, at the minute we have a, a kind of really serious situation around accommodation for children from 16 to 18 who are allegedly in care. But uh, yeah, so um, so I think um, I think, though, I, want, I really do want to go back to my last point in from the quote from Arundhati Roy. This requires action at a range of levels. We really need to be, uh, as active citizens, challenging in all sorts of ways. We can't just rely on the poor old lawyers. They're, they've been pretty denuded through the through austerity as well and hollowed out. Um, we support them where we can. We give them money for the cases and the fights that they're doing. But we also need to be... Uh, lobbying our politicians we need to be active citizens around building this society nobody can do this for us we're all in this together in that sense and i think it's really important when you do have things like the uncrc uh, as clear frameworks but when you don't you you have to use whatever you can you have to um you know it's we're yeah in england we're, we're we we don't have the same le le levers at the moment probably as you do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that probably answers the question from Erica at Homestar Altney. Are there similar moves to incorporate UNCRC by UK government? And not that I know of. And I was <laughs> very disheartened. And we wrote, we did a submission back to the case for change that was published from the review for children's social care. And that was one of our points. But you know, you're not you haven't addressed the UNCRC at all. You haven't mentioned it. Yeah. So um, it's Tina, Tina from Homestar, uh, Tina from Homestar, Tina from Connect rather. Have you, st are you still there with your hand up? Yeah, I took my hand down just to be polite. Hi, everybody. Thanks <laughs> right, very well, much. For the, you know, you hate, you hate it when someone's got their hand up for an hour. You know, it's like, uh, anyway, because um, I knew you'd noted me, but thanks very much. It was really um, about whether you're aware of much work going on about communicating communicating with families and with with parents and carers um, I know we've been working with you um, and with together um, to to kind of push and get get some movement on communicating information about UNCRC with parents uh, we've also asked Scottish government but it seems to be kind of sitting there we did look at some information and material but it definitely lumped parents in with adults which is okay but not okay um, and I just wondered if if there's anything that um, you know, what, what can we do to to get messages out there more or do you know of work that's going on to, to do that because I think there is a bit of a risk of because um, I think there's quite a lot of work quite rightly about sharing UNCRC with children and young people if and in schools but if families aren't brought along with that information sharing there is a bit of a risk of polarization or you know people feeling a bit insecure or whatever um we did raise this with Shirley Ann Somerville but we've not heard anything back so okay um I'll maybe start by saying something and then Juliet breeze chip in um, I suppose it feels like it's it's very early days and some of the you know civil service structures have just been set up. So I know we've started a group 
um, of parents' organisations, which I was going to mention later on um, or at the end of the seminar. And we're very happy for people to get in touch with us about that. But looking at what we think needs to happen and how to communicate the messages to parents and then how to empower them to act upon it or be able to share information with parents. Very early days of that group and very early days for Scottish Government. So Scottish Government has set, over, set up overall a strategic implementation board, which we're represented on and which will be feeding parents' views and views from parents' organisations in. Um, somebody has been appointed um, just very recently to start off the work on raising parental awareness. There was somebody in post before, but that was before the act, so now it's really looking at working with the Strategic Implementation Board and looking at how you know, how that can be communicated. And we'll certainly be talking to them, as I know you will, Tina and, and Kat from Inquire, who are MCs on the call. And we will be having meetings and putting forward the ways that we think, um, you know, messages need to be communicated. Um, and I think it's going to be a long process. It needs to be a universal process at the key key touch points. Um, when I was in Sweden, I remember seeing an absolutely beautiful book, um, sort of picture book, kids picture book for two year olds. And it was actually for parents to read with their children. And I think, you know, there's so many things that we could be doing and need to do. Um, and it's, you know, it's not going to be, we do an awareness campaign um, in two months time and then that stops. It will be an ongoing process that all the universal services and information services have to be aware of. And I think, you know, that is beginning to happen, but it's the beginning of a process. I'll hand over to Julia and Breach to say a little bit more about that. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's something that we absolutely need to prioritise. Um, and I do agree that this may become kind of second in comparison to telling children and young people about their rights. Um, but I think the work that Claire's talked about um, is absolutely fundamental to make to making sure that the bill delivers on its intention. Because if families, if parents and families and carers don't understand the power of children's rights and about how it's supporting them to be the best parents, parents, the most supportive parents that they can, we're never going to see that kind of culture change that we're looking for. Um, so I think it's about conversations like this, and it is about working at a strategic level with government to make sure that right across universal um, services for, um, for families, the UNCRC is there, it's explicit, it talks about what the rights are for children, how the rights support families, and really importantly, what complaints mechanisms there are, what parents can do, what carers can do if their child's rights aren't respected, if they're not getting the support that they need. Because I think it goes two ways. We have to, it's absolutely essential that families know that children have these rights and that there's the support for families. But it's not just enough to know that you have it. You have to also be able to assert yourself and say, the rights of my child aren't being respected and make sure that something is done about it. Um, so yeah, we need to have conversations like this. We need to learn as much as possible from parenting organization about what, what's working and about what's not working. We need to create safe spaces for parenting organizations to share their experience with government officials, to inform the guidance, to um, kind of hold government to account on what they're doing to deliver, to deliver their um, obligations. Um, and I think through through those kind of safe conversations with government to make sure that the right mechanisms are in place, we should be able to successfully raise awareness of the UNCRC and the power of incorporation with parents, but also um, raise awareness with parents of what they can do when things aren't working and things aren't going well. Yesterday I was reading an article uh, about research with parents who had children with uh, a range of disabilities and about their struggles to get what they need from services, uh, a range of services. I think it's really important to remember that in the majority of cases, the biggest protectors of children's rights, the biggest fighters for children's rights are parents. Um, and that actually, uh, we really don't want to set up a situation where it becomes 
a kind of framing of parents as as a parents' rights and children's rights as oppositional to each other, that would be disastrous. And that we, you know, that we really honor and respect the role that an awful lot of parents play in trying to get a better life for their children, particularly say children with disabilities or where children, I, I know so many parents who are fighting for their children to get access to mental health services at the minute uh, or access to um, proper education for their learning needs. So it's really, really crucial that we don't turn this into the government communicates with children about their rights and that that becomes the way it's framed. That would be disastrous actually and could lead to kind of unhelpful and undesirable backlashes among some parents. I think in a way that leads us really quite nicely onto a question from Kat Thompson from Inquire, which is about how can we ensure, and, and for those of you who don't know, um, Inquire is both a helpline and an information service for um, parents of children with additional support needs, and they do great work in terms of highlighting to parents and children about what their children's rights are at school and quite often obviously those rights in order to enable them to access them you know sometimes have to be taken to tribunal but where necessary or you know where possible are better um you know negotiated for at at the school level and only escalated i think i think that's so true of everything if we can embed these things and make them happen in the place of practice rather than getting into that oppositional space, that it helps. But Kat, sorry, getting on to Kat's question, she's asking how can we ensure that when challenges are made about children's rights being breached, the learning is wider than just one child's experience so that it goes on to, you know, affect practice and policy. I find I find it very dispiriting as a an old academic now how much we already know and we've known for quite a while about what people need what parents need to raise their children well what we need from services what they need from services you know there is an awful lot of evidence out there it either gets forgotten or it just doesn't get disseminated properly or i, I don't quite understand uh, why very simple, very basic lessons around um, people understanding what they're entitled to, being treated with respect, being treated as experts on their own lives rather than seen as problems. Why those lessons, which we, we have learned from a whole range of research, just aren't embedded in services. It feels like we have to constantly relearn the lessons. And, you know, as an academic, I'm never going to complain about commission, more research being commissioned. But quite frankly, we don't need a lot of research about some of these things. We know what families need to live good lives. We just don't act on it. The political will isn't there. Yeah, I completely, completely agree with you. Um, I think, I think it is, yeah, it, it's just, it's an ongoing frustration. Um, when it comes to UNCRC incorporation, um, in the most serious of cases, if a case is taken to court, um, it may be that the court finds that a piece of legislation, that a policy is incompatible with the UNCRC. So even though that case might be brought um, from just one child's experience, the court actually would require um, the government parliament to make legislative change. So whatever caused the breach of that child's rights was actually um, stopped and remedied and legislation was updated, um, refreshed, revised to prevent the breach of, um, of, of other children and young people's rights. And so I think that's where kind of broader civil society, law clinics um, can actually get involved in strategic litigation. So for example, where, where there is an example um, of a child's rights being breached, then organisations can come together. And I know the, um, the charity that Bridge was talking about in, in England um, does a lot of strategic litigation to actually take a case on behalf of a child, but to make sure that it results in broader legislative change, to make sure that whatever was breaching that child's rights doesn't happen to any other child. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I've learned a lot over the last few years about, you know, kind of like how 
how how people coming together and supporting a charity to take uh, cases, and, and, but then disseminating the learning. Yeah, is it's really important. Right, I'm going to going to ask um, one final question, and then I suppose I'd, I'd ask you both to answer it, obviously, um, but to come up with any concluding remarks that you'd like to make about kind of learning from today and things that we need to do to take this forward. Um, somebody's asked, and I think it's really important, it's a question that comes up quite a lot, is about how we best promote an understanding for early years children, two to five, to empower them and ensure they have a, some sort of understanding in a positive way. I'd, I'd just like to add something to this for anyone in the seminar, but we, um, our parents and across Scotland, we did a, a webinar a couple of months ago about how has lockdown and the pandemic restrictions affected an impact on the under fives? Really because we felt nobody else was looking at it and a lot of people came and felt exactly the same and there'd been very little research on it. And at that stage, most families, most, most children are in the care of their parents for the most time and particularly even more during lockdown, you know, all those supports, that kind of village that it takes to raise a child were stripped away. Um, so I would sort of commend our briefing to you, obviously, it's on our website and there's an awful lot of learning about what happened during that period. And those children have rights equally as much, and those years are incredibly important for children and their families. So how can we promote that understanding for early years children to empower them and ensure some sort of understanding in a positive way? I don't know if one, this is an answer, but um, one of the things that was really, well, extraordinary and unprecedented, wasn't it, was when suddenly, uh, you know, at, in the early days of the of lockdown, we realised yeah. that all the services, nearly not all, completely were retreating, and that there was all this anxiety about what was happening behind closed doors. And on the one hand, I shared that anxiety. On the other, it made me really think about a model that was so reliant upon professionals and that was so reliant upon, in the case of child protection, which is my area, that was so reliant upon home visits by professionals and by professionals then talking to other people. And I know it's full of pitfalls. I know it's absolutely full of pitfalls, but I, I do feel very committed to trying to think about enlarging our understanding of the village because Claire you're right it does take a village but it isn't a village of professionals and I know it's full of pitfalls but we do need to build up community capacity and I go back to my earlier point about for young children the best protector of their rights particularly in the absence of their being able to articulate their voice will be often their parents their mothers um, not just their mothers, their fathers as well, um, their grandparents, their aunts. Um, so we need to empower those people um, and support those people. Now, I know that's not quite answering the question, but it did really strike me that we would built this very, very professionally led, expert led approach to working with families. And we had a pandemic and suddenly a lot of the things we relied upon were stripped away. And it was not very comfortable. And maybe again, it's another legacy we need to revisit, just like the housing crisis. What have we created and is it fit for purpose? Sorry, struggling to find my uh, mute button. Um, again, completely agree with Brad. We must continue these conversations. I'd love to, yeah. Yes, absolutely fascinating. I mean, I think, I think in terms of um, younger children's rights, I just completely endorse what Brid says about um, we need to be looking at what support we provide parents to raise awareness of the UNCRC and of children and young people's rights. It's parents who will be advocating for the rights of children, um, of, of our most youngest, um, our most young children. Um, and it's also parents who um, are able to um, understand their children, understand the kind of the wants, the needs, the views of their children, that they're the best at communicating with the youngest children and advocating on their behalf. So 
for the early years work, it's absolutely about, again, as I said before, getting um, more information about the UNCLC and children's rights into universal services, um, but also making sure that, um, that we really work alongside parents, alongside families to develop that understanding of children and young people's rights. So as they're parenting, they are communicating their child, they're listening to their child and they're able to advocate on behalf of their child. Okay, thanks. That, that's really great. I mean, it is, I was really struck by what you said, Bruce, because I've been thinking about that quite a lot. Just before the pandemic struck, we were doing a pilot of something called Open Kindergartens, which um, open preschools, which I'd seen in Scandinavia, but actually, you know, it's, it's kind of not rocket science, really, their parent and toddler groups but with some professional help and allowing parents and children coming together. And I think, you know, there's an evaluation of that. We've found a lot of things, but one, one of the, that was run with, uh, I should say, with Children in Scotland, with Midlothian Sure Start and with uh, City of Edinburgh Council and with Stirling University doing um, the evaluation. One of the key things coming out of that really was parental isolation and its impact on mental health and the absolute change that it made for parents when they were more connected. And what we were seeing was that so many of the connections relied on those professional connections, uh, which were stripped away during the pandemic. But if parents had a network, it's protected them so much more. And I suppose that in some way has also got something to do with children's rights and parents' rights to actually, you know, be afforded the necessary protection to be able to develop that because actually some of the key things that we're talking about here as a background, as poverty, housing, etc. If people don't have those protections, it then becomes really, really difficult to forge the social connections and so on. I mean, People need the basics in order to achieve their more, you know, some of the, some of the other rights. But uh, I don't know. I'm probably going to finish there. I think I'm maybe moving off children's rights. <laughs> but essentially, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming. It's been a great session. I don't think it's going to be the end of it. We want to put on some more sessions about parental awareness. We're going to be talking to people and asking about parents and parenting organizations about what we can and should do and we will be running other webinars about this so watch this space and thank you very much <laughs>